Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Golden Meadow, and it is a really tremendous honor and privilege for me to be able to introduce Barbara Landau to you. Barbara did her doctoral studies at the University of Pennsylvania, where she worked with Lila Gleitman, who was also my advisor a number of years earlier, which makes Barbara my academic sister, which is really terrific since I don't have any sisters, so I love it. Barbara has been bi-coastal in her jobs, having successfully skirted the Midwest. Her first job was on the East Coast at Columbia University. She then went to the University of California at Irvine, and finally came back to the East to the University of Delaware, where she is now the Johns Hopkins University, where she is now the Dick and Lydia Todd Professor and Director of the Science of Learning Institute. So Barbara has done seminal research on how experiential variation and genetic variation interact with developmental process to promote or to limit the development of spatial cognition and language. She not only studies typically developing children, but also congenitally blind children and children with Williams syndrome. In her early groundbreaking studies, Barbara showed that congenitally blind infants acquire language just like sighted children, um, including words such as look and see, which you might not think blind children would be able to understand, and Barbara showed that they did. She also showed that blind children can navigate untraveled routes in a novel spatial environment, making it clear that they have intact geometric representations and spatial reasoning. But Barbara's not only made empirical contributions, she's also proposed an important theory involving the differential maturational rates of dorsal and ventral streams in the brain that explains how spatial representation and language can go awry in development. Barbara's theory provides a novel explanation of the abilities and disabilities of, in Williams syndrome, a rare genetic disorder with an unusual pattern of cognition that spares language but profoundly impairs spatial cognition. So as you know, Barbara is receiving the William James Award for Distinguished Achievements in Psychological Science today, and you will soon see why, as she tells us about why, how language changes thought in her talk. Well, thank you. Thank you, Susan, very much for that kind introduction. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. And of course, I'm very grateful to um, and honored to have received the William James Fellow Award. Um, Susan mentioned that I do work on atypically developing children. I'm going to talk about none of that today. Just for those of you who are wondering, it is all about typically developing children. And the question that I'm going to ask is whether language changes thought. So in general, the field has two ways of thinking about the language and thought interaction. There are two directions that one can consider. One direction is um, thinking about whether thought, pre-linguistic thought, serves as the, um, the, the, um, uh, the, the support for language learning. And we have um, very distinguished philosophers and psychologists, Jerry Fodor, Rene Barajan, Liz Belke, who have done tremendous work on understanding what the pre-linguistic uh, logic could be that could support language learning. The other way of thinking about the language thought interaction is that um, language affects thought. And of course, that's what I'm going to focus on today. Within this issue, there are, again, two different ways of thinking about whether or not language affects thought. So one way is to think about whether learning a particular language changes non-linguistic thought. So we have more than 5,000 languages today across the world. And the question is, if you learn language A versus language B, does that change your non-linguistic representations or the way that you think non-linguistically? The other way of thinking about this question, whether language affects thought, is to think about what happens if you have a language. That is, are you a species? that has a language. And so here we can compare human babies and young children who, of course, do acquire language very effortlessly early in life, and the language has very deep properties, as compared to, let's say, chicks or mice or rats who will never have a language. They just simply don't have the capacity. Language is species specific. So there are two different kinds of questions, whether learning a particular language, A versus B, changes non-linguistic thought. And then there's another question, whether having any language at all changes non-linguistic thought. So does language change thought, and if so, how? Well, I'm going to argue that the answer to this question depends in part on 
what part of the problem you happen to be looking at. And here we have the, um, the, the blind man with the elephant, blind men exploring the elephant. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, with this um, sort of cartoonish um, um, instantiation of the question, every person, blindfolded person, is exploring the elephant. And the question is, what is an elephant? And of course, depending on where you look, depending on where you're feeling, you have a different answer. So for this person, um, the elephant might be something that's long and thin. For this person, the elephant might be something that's broad and wrinkly, and so forth. So it depends on where you're looking locally, um, whether or not what you think um, the elephant is. Similarly, if you're asking the question, does language change thought, the field in general, depending on where they have looked, have come up with two different answers, very distinct ones, and those are definitely, yes it does, and definitely not, no it doesn't. So that's what we're gonna to try to deal with today. And what I'm gonna do um, in the talk is to review basically two prominent hypotheses that I sort of think capture the way that people think about um, the language thought interaction, whether language affects thought. And I'm gonna offer a third hypothesis which I think accounts for the existing data as well as much other data. But first I wanna go back in history a little bit and give you a little bit of background with respect to my own interests in language and thought. And Susan already covered some of this. The early probe for me about the language thought relationship had to do with the growth and development of a child who was born blind, the child who's, who's blind from birth. And my question at the time was what is the role of sensory and perceptual experience and how does it interact with what I'm gonna call mind-driven aspects of our knowledge? That is to say, some of our information comes from exploring the world, either visually or haptically if we're blind, but some information and some knowledge comes specifically from the mind itself. And this work, which was done in conjunction with Lila Gleitman, who was my advisor at the time of my PhD, um, um, drove us to some, some very substantial conclusions, which I'll just detail very, very quickly, um, that really do emphasize the importance of having a mind, a human mind, in exploring and, and learning things about the world. When I began uh, my thinking about this, it actually was, I, as Susan said, I arrived just after uh, she had done her dissertation, and she and Heidi Feldman and Lila Gleitman had at that time discovered that children born congenitally deaf could nevertheless construct a gestural language without linguistic input. And I came into graduate school and I said, well, that's fine, but those people, those, those, those deaf individuals, they had the means to interpret the world because they could see. And so I proposed that we should study the blind child to, as an obvious compliment. Uh, a child who had full linguistic input, but much reduced experience through vision. And the study took two parts. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, or the, the day before at the opening comments, um, my advisors encouraged me to read very broadly, and one of the people that I read was William James, and I couldn't help but go back and remember uh, and, and find the paragraphs that he wrote that I found so meaningful when I was first thinking about the blind child and whether or not they could even develop a sense of space. And William James said, the seeing baby's eyes take in the whole room at once and discriminative attention must arise in him before single objects are visually discerned. The blind child, on the contrary, must form his mental image of the room by the addition piece to piece of parts, which he learns to know successively. So that implies the input is very, very different for a blind child than a sighted child. And yet, what Liz Belke and Henry Gleitman and I found in looking at spatial knowledge was that the blind child, even a two-year-old blind child, and a, comparable, and a sighted child as well, they can both construct the same geometric representations of layouts in the world despite these vast differences in experience. The second part to my questions at the time had to do with language in the blind. And here Lila and I were thinking about, well, what would happen if you didn't have a means to interpret the world? And of course, we relied on John Locke, who said many things about the blind. He was a very diehard empiricist. And the quote that best represents his view is, I think if it will be granted easily that if a child were kept in a place where he never saw any other but black and white till he were a man, he would have no more ideas of scarlet or green than he that from his childhood never tasted an oyster or a pineapple has of those relishes. That is to say, if you don't have sensory input to feed 
a lexical uh, concept, a concept or a word for that concept, then you will never develop them. But Lila and I found that the blind child actually does learn the meanings of words like look and see and color terms, despite the obvious lack of any sensory or perceptual input for these particular words. And this is um, this panel actually shows um, a picture of our, our, uh, our main participant, whose name was Kelly, uh, responding to our command to look up. And so Kelly's interpretation of the word look was to discover things with your hands. And so when we said look up to the sighted child, the sighted child, of course, goes like this, even, by the way, if they're blindfolded. But if a blind child, if this blind child is told to look up, they go like this, reaching in order to explore whatever is above. So Kelly definitely, the, sighted, the blind child, did definitely develop um, really quite uh, detailed representations of those visual words. So that's my background, and that's how I came to think about the broader question of whether language affects thought. In particular, for Kelly, our theory was that the way that she learned the meanings for these words, look and see as well as color terms, was actually through the structure of the language itself. So I will be saying more about the structure of the language itself and its power throughout the talk, but that was our hypothesis at the time. Um, and that's the question, does language affect thought in some way, uh, that's continued to occupy me uh, for the rest of my career. Does language affect thought, and if so, how? So now I want to fast forward to sort of now um, and say what the ubiquitous take on the language affecting thought hypothesis question is. Probably everybody in this room knows about the Warfian hypothesis. The idea is the language that you speak, the particular language that you speak, causes you to, let's say, view the world, think about the world in a very different way if you're lang learning language A versus B. And this is a quote that was published uh, in, um, in the New York Times Magazine section from 2010. It's a part of a review of a book by a person named Guy Deutscher who very much endorsed the Warfian view. And I just want to read uh, a bit of this to you so that you'll get the flavor of the Warfian hypothesis. Um, when your language routinely obliges you to specify certain types of information, it forces you to be attentive to certain details in the world and to certain aspects of experience that speakers of other languages may not be required to think about all the time. Emphasis mine in the next. And since such habits of speech are cultivated from the earliest age, it's only natural that they settle into habits of mind that go beyond language itself, affecting your experiences, your perceptions, your associations, your feelings, your memories, and your orientation in the world. Notice that is an enormously strong hypothesis, that it affects everything you could possibly imagine. Now, I want to say that this hypothesis has actually led to quite strong claims, especially in the popular literature. So I'm going to um, use as an illustration uh, a, a TED talk that was given in 2013 by a behavioral economist named Keith Chen from UCLA. And Chen's thesis was that speaking a language that doesn't obligatorily, that is, by necessity, mark future tense, such as Chinese, which was his native language, strongly correlates with higher savings compared to speakers of languages that do not, that do obligatorily mark tense, as in English. This is a TED talk, widely distributed, and I think anybody who pauses for just a minute can realize that that's actually sort of a puzzling hypothesis. And probably what happened is that they discovered what the savings rates were and then went back and conjectured from what the patterns of the language were. But that's obviously just a just so story. And so I want to say to you that when you read things on popular literature about language affecting thought, you must be very careful because it's not a good thing to be promulgating really broad and deep hypotheses on the basis of really quite flimsy data or questionable data. In any case, we're lucky that most of the psych psychological science that's done is not of this ilk. Um, and so now I want to go to the two versions of, the, uh, the, uh, of language and thought that are normally talked about, that are sort of part of the conversation in the literature. The first I'm going to call the classic Warfian hypothesis, and this is the idea that language reshapes non-linguistic thought. Whatever your non-linguistic thought is, if you have language A versus language B, it will reshape it. And one of the examples that I want to give you is about color terms, which has been a testbed for a very long time for the Warfian hypothesis, because languages tend to cut up the, the space of colors in very different ways across different languages. It's not unconstrained, but there are differences. And so the idea here is that learning a particular language, language A versus language B, shapes non-linguistic categories in accord with the native language distinction. 
This has been done not only in English, the study, people have used English, but they've also used a variety of other languages to test the hypothesis that if you have a distinction that you make in one language that's a different distinction in another language, that is, it crosses different boundaries, you will have different perceptual discrimination. And I'll tell you about this experiment in just a second, but basically the idea here is we have four shades that range from sort of pretty much green to pretty much blue. Um, these two patches, these are, by the way, all of equal values physically. Psychologically, they're somewhat different, but in terms of naming, they're very different. So it tends to be the case that if you have hues that look roughly like this, people tend to call them green. And if you have hues that look roughly like this, people tend to call them blue. And so what happens is that this is called a between category distinction. These are the greens and these are the blues. Um, and this is called a within category distinction. There are two different types of greens or two different types of blues. And so the idea here is that if your language shapes your perceptual discrimination, as Gilbert et al. have hypothesized, then what you should see is that people who speak a language um, that has greens and blues here should show a bigger difference between these two shades than people who speak a different language. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the cross-linguistic data, but I'll just tell you the snippet of the English data that will suffice for us. I want to say, though, that the conclusion of this study by Gilbert et al. in 2006 was that language may affect perceptual discrimination. Words are important here, okay? It's about discrimination. It's not about anything else. It's perceptual discrimination. So here's the experiment. Um, basically, that they gave people um, patches of, of um, colors in which there was one outlier. So in this case, the outlier is the thing that looks that's called blue by English speakers, and the other elements are all in this category over here. So that's a between category distinction. And people were asked to fixate here, and then the panel was brought on with all of these colors, and all they had to do was identify the outlier. And they're going to ask whether or not it's quicker for people to identify the outlier if it is, represents a between linguistic category distinction compared to if it's a within distinction category. And they went a little bit farther. They said, actually, it's because of the way the brain works. And so what they did was they actually presented to the right visual field, in which case it projects to the left hemisphere, or they projected to the left, hemisphere, left visual field, in which case it projects to the right hemisphere. And what they found was, indeed, the between categories, distinctions were faster than the within category, as you would expect if language had affected something about your decision. But it was modulated by which visual field it was presented in. And it was, the distinction was that there was a faster reaction time for these between category judgments only in the right visual field that is projecting to the left hemisphere. So, and in addition, they presented some data that suggested that the pattern was disrupted if there was a verbal interference at the same time, that if you were made to do something with language, that effect would go away. So it seemed to them it was a linguistic effect, but their interpretation was very strong. And again, words matter, language may affect perceptual discrimination, okay? I think that's gone too far, I'll say why um, in just a minute. But that's an example of version one. The particular language you speak affects uh, the way that you, non, your non-linguistic representations. The second version that I think is actually more interesting in a way is that language, having a language, causes a radical transformation of thought. And the example I want to give here is spatial reorientation. And for those of you who are not spatial reorientation aficionados, I'll go through this uh, briefly uh, and, and try to make it clear. But it turns out there's, um, there's a very interesting phenomenon within the literature on spatial reorientation. Reorient, by reorientation, we mean if you get disoriented in a space and then you must reorient yourself, what information do you use? And some of this work, actually the seminal work, was done by um, Randy Gallistel and Ken Cheng back in the early 80s in which they found that if you put a rat into a chamber that is roughly rectangular and you bait it at one corner and then you take the rat out and disorient the rat and put the rat back in in the middle, they actually make a very peculiar error. Sometimes they go to the baited side, the baited corner, but sometimes they go to the corner that's exactly geometrically opposite that baited corner. And the question is why? And Cheng and Gallistel proposed that actually they were ignoring all of the salient visual cues. I mean, rats are not visual anyway, but in you know, smell and so forth, they were ignoring those surface cues 
in order to focus on what we call the geometry of the space. So in, in, in geometric terms, this corner with the long wall, let's say, to the left and the short wall to the right is actually geometrically equivalent uh, to this corner. So the rats were essentially recording the geometry of the space and were essentially ignoring the surface cues. Now, Linda Hermer and Liz Spelke then adopted the method of disorienting um, animals in these chambers, and they adopted it for young children. So they took 18 and 24 month olds, and they also put them in a rectangular chamber like this, and actually it was sort of a, a, originally just a black chamber with no landmarks at all. And they showed them a, a, a toy that was hidden in this corner, and then they disoriented them, closed their eyes, and turned them around. And they found that 18 to 24 month olds, and actually just about every age that's been tested, if there are no surface cues, or if the, if the, if the uh, enclosure is all black and there are no landmarks at all, children and adults uh, make the same geometric error as rats, okay? The peculiar thing in addition to that was the very youngest children really seemed to act just like rats. And so they too ignored the surface cues. They ignored the landmarks and basically went with geometry. Later on, these children, when you get to be you know, four or five or six years old and certainly adults, if you have the landmarks as well, then it seems you combine the information and so then you get it exactly right. And so you can find the object in the right corner. Okay. So, the proposal, the reason this is important is because they had a proposal about why that changes. Why does, the, why does a young child, a toddler, act just like a rat, but a four to six year old now acts like an adult that is they can combine the geometry with the landmarks? And their answer was this. The combinatorial properties of the language faculty serve to represent relationships that the child's nonverbal systems cannot capture because of encapsulation of those systems. That is to say, they're represented in, sep in separate places. The geometry and the landmarks are separate. But if you have language and you can represent it linguistically, then that's a huge advantage. Okay. So that's their hypothesis, that it's language itself having a language that is causing the difference between the rat and the human. This hypothesis, which I think has some real merit, has actually been um, taken very seriously in the philosophical and linguistic literature. Um, those bodies of people really have admired this, so the philosopher Carruthers says, Hermer Vasquez et al. provides strong evidence that the integration of geometry with other sorts of information depends on natural language. Okay? And Berwick and Chomsky recently have asked, why do humans have language at all? Because language is the lingua franca that binds together the different representations from geometric and non-geometric modules, just like an inner mental tool should. So people seem to admire this hypothesis in the idea that having a language does something extraordinary for you. These versions, both version one and version two, are interesting, but they really have critical weaknesses. So for example, the language shapes thought hypothesis version one it's really unclear what's changing. Was it really a change in perceptual discrimination? I really doubt it. Could it have been memory? It's possible. It's possible that it's just a linguistic effect. That is to say, you're coding it linguistically and therefore you're showing the effects of language. Secondly, very often what's called a non-linguistic task in this field actually is, is impermeated with language. So it actually is a linguistic task. And so you have to be very careful about that. And finally, the other weakness is that this hypothesis requires that you use a language habitually, and we don't know what the length of time is. Is it over the lifetime, and then you get to the point that your savings changes because you have a, a, a language that um, marks the future tense? Unclear. The second hypothesis, the version two, that radically, ling language radically transforms thought, it, the strong version of this that is necessary, language is necessary, is already ruled out by evidence from animals. So animals do combine. It's not that, like they act like the Cheng uh, and Galastel rats um, ignoring the surface cues at all. So we don't need language to do this. But it's also a problem that the mechanism seems completely unspecified. And I think this is a huge problem in the field, which I hope to provide part of a solution to this morning. Okay, I wanna move on to the third hypothesis that I'm gonna propose, and I'm gonna call it the recoding hypothesis. Um, in the past, I've called it the momentary hypothesis for anybody who has uh, an inkling here of the past work, but um, we'll call it the recoding hypothesis right now, and I'm going to spell out what I mean by this and show you an example of how it could work with some experiments. So the idea here is that language provides a rich formalism. It's not, what it means to have a language is to have a formalism that really matters when you're encoding 
your experience. And that itself, having that formalism, converts a huge advantage for cognition. And the case study I'm going to be dealing with is a, a very simple case of binding color and location, storing colors in their locations. These are the references the, uh, for the, the papers in which the, the empirical data has been reported. This person, Banchi Desalain, was my graduate student at the time that we started this. She's done, she did most of the experimental work with me. Um, and so let me spell it out. The recoding hypothesis says language recodes what we see. It provides a rich representational formalism for recoding what we see. It includes both semantics, the meanings of words, and it also includes syntax, the way that we combine words. The benefit of recoding occurs right in the moment of, 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 of doing the task. Its role changes over development, and it's enormously powerful. It can lead to cognitive enrichment, but it does not change underlying non-linguistic representations. So it's not effect on perceptual discrimination. So for some background, I'm going to tell you feature conjunctions are hard. So a lot of people in here, if you have any background in vision, you'll recognize these effects very quickly. Visual search in adults shows that if you're searching for a feature, for a color, a particular color in an array or a particular shape, is really fast and it's called parallel. But a conjunction search, if you're searching for a color and shape, it's very slow and it tends to be serial. You have to look one by one. It requires attention. And this was one of the founding um, um, research findings from Ann Treisman uh, um, uh, back in 1984. So I'm going to give you an example, and I want a little audience participation here. I want you to look for the tar this target okay, in the next display. Here I go. How many found it? Everybody found it. It popped out. It was immediate. It was totally easy. Now let's do the same exercise. Look for the target, the same target. Okay. Raise your hand when you see it. And those of you who haven't found it yet, it's OK. You will find it, I promise you. Okay, but you do need to go serially one by one. So that just shows you that binding the color and the location or the color and the shape is really, really hard for the visual system to do. That's something that's a weakness of, on the part of the visual system in some way. The general point is that visual search, conjunction search are hard. Turns out patients with vision disor attention disorders due to brain damage show deficits in this particular kind of search. It also turns out that memory for color and location is really poor in typically developing four to six year olds and in adolescents with Williams syndrome. And I have a picture of a child, one of our early participants with Williams syndrome, because to remind me, this is actually how we sort of stumbled on this, this, um, this method in this particular case, which turns out to be very important. We noticed that these children had a tremendous difficulty representing the color and location of something as simple as the stimulus. And I'm going to show you a lot of data from typically developing four-year-olds that showed the same. So we began to think, could it be possible that this weakness in the visual system is aided by uh, language? And so I want to ask three questions. First of all, if there is change, is it long, short, or momentary? What's the nature of the linguistic representation that affects the change? And how powerful is it relative to other mechanisms? And these are going to be my answers. It's momentary. It involves lexical, that is the word meanings, plus the syntax. It's very abstract, and it's very powerful. So here I'm going to show you the basic task, and this is all going to be with four-year-olds unless, say, say unless I tell you otherwise. And here's the task. You show a four-year-old child this thing, and you say, look at this. And then they can look at it as long as they want, and then it goes off for one second, one second, and then three options come on, and we say, which one is exactly the same as the one you just saw? So probably everybody knows which one, but if you're confused, do not worry. It's very common. So I actually can't remember which one was in the first panel, but the, to the typical errors are between these two because of the color location. One is a reflection of the other. So in the task, um, we had three different target types. We had a vertical split, a horizontal split, and a diagonal split. And for each one of these different target types, for each trial, the structure of the trials were just like I showed you and just sort of more abstractly. If, I, if they saw a vertical split, they would get the same one, the identity, and its reflection. And then they would get one of the other splits. So either they would get a horizontal split or they would get a diagonal split. So always three options when after the, after the uh, target goes off. 
I want to make a point that our native object recognition system actually considers these things, reflections, to be equivalent. So for purposes of object recognition, pretty much the visual system ignores this reflection. So it makes sense for us to have problems identifying a target and its reflection. We only need these, the reflections and the distinctions between them, to distinguish, for example, certain letters and numbers. So when you learn P's and B's, there's a P and there's a, and there's B's and there are D's. Those are different tra geometric transformations of, e of each other. And for those, we need to mark the differences among, across the, the, uh, the items. So here's the first experiment. Again, four-year-old children. And we started out, we thought to ourselves, let's just do a very, very simple manipulation with language. So the experiment is you show them this thing, and either you do the no label, you say, look at this, and then goes off for a second, and then which one is exactly the same as you just saw, or we try to novel label, because there's an abundant literature, including some that I've been involved in, that shows that if you have a label associated with an object, it tends to draw attention to the object, at least that's the claim. So we thought, let's just label it. So then we said, in another condition, completely different set of subjects, look at this, this is a DAX and then which one is exactly the same as you just saw. And the results were these. Um, remember that random uh, chance uh, probability performance is 33%, so everybody's above 33%. These are the corrects, so they're about 66% and 62%. There's no difference between the label and the no label condition. Uh, they're right around 60. And what's interest, interesting is the errors. So the errors are primarily the reflections, just as we predicted. So there, the children are not hardly ever picking the other split. If they have a horizontal split, they're not picking a vertical split. They're picking the right split, but they're mixing up what the assignment of color to location is. So this is what the first experiment showed us, and my graphic for representing what the child must be representing is something like this. They're representing the geometric split, but they're not sure which side the red and the green go on. Okay? So it's, there's no assignment of color to the locations. Then we thought, okay, let's just go whole hog here. Let's just say, look at this. The red is on the left, or of course, for other stimuli, if the red was on the right, we said on the right, top and bottom and so forth goes off, so look at this, the red is on the left, goes off for a second, and the items come on, which one is exactly the same as you just saw. And here what we find is performance goes up to 80% from 60%. So it's a huge bump up. These are, again, four-year-old children. We get the same error patterns, and this will be persistent throughout all of the experiments I tell you about. And so my graphic for representing what the child knows is that now they're actually doing much better. They represent not only the split, but the color location assignments. Now we begin to think, well, okay, we have to begin thinking about this. What is language doing here? We told them left and right. So um, we say, look at this. Let's see where the red is. And then we flashed the whole or just the red part. And so just to give you an example of a flashing one, we show them, look at this. Look where the red is. And then show me the one that's exactly the same. And we did that with the whole as well. We did flashing with the whole. And the experiment three shows back down to 60%. So that, the salience method doesn't do the trick at all, and the representation is still a vertical split with nothing else. Follow-ups growing and pointing, so our vision science uh, colleagues said to us, don't make it flash on and off, make it grow, because flashing on and off is like it's absent. So we said, fine, we'll make it grow. So we made it grow in one experiment. I'll show you what it looks like. We also had children in a separate experiment point, because we're good developmental psychologists, and we thought, Surely, pointing to the red will work. So here's what it looks like to grow the red side. Look at this. Look at the red. And then, which one is exactly the same as you've just seen? And here's what happens. All at the same. So this is flashing, this is growing, and this is pointing. That is to say, we're back down at 60%. Those have absolutely no effect. Okay. So now we think, okay, we said left, maybe we should just give any kind of a spatial term. Let's try the red is touching the green, and we used connected to and adjacent to, which one is exactly the same as you just saw. And the representation is, again, no better than we saw before. It doesn't assign color location, and here are the first four experiments that I just told you about. Whole or no label is 60%, top, bottom, right, and left is around 80%, flashing, pointing, growing around 60%, and touching, which is neutral back down to 60%. So the only thing that works is the red is the left of the green. Nothing else works. Nothing else that any vision scientist or developmentalist would have predicted. So what is going on? What does language do? I'm going to start by trying to convince you that these are changes that occur right in the moment of the task for the child. 
So what we did after the left, uh, in, in the left-right experiment was we also did a post-task. And so after the child was done with the experiment, we ran a production study and a comprehension study to see whether or not children who knew the meanings of left and right, that is, this is on my left and this is on my right, did better because they had a long-term representation of that term, which was brought to bear on the task, than children who didn't know it. So it, in the production task, we had a smiley face. We presented at one of four locations. And we said, where's the smiley face? It is. And then they say, they give a spatial term. In the comprehension task, we said, see this, they see this square? Draw an X on the left, right, top, bottom of the square. And so that's a comprehension task, and they placed an X wherever they thought. Here are the results, which aren't too surprising. Top and bottom for four-year-olds at ceiling. They know their tops and bottoms, but they do not know their lefts and rights. Okay? And it varies. It varies enormously, which is a good thing for us, because there are some kids who just don't know left or right at all, and there are some kids who are all the way up at ceiling at 80% for these things. I have to say that even the kids who don't know left and right do know that it's along the, somewhere along the horizontal axis, but it's usually randomly placed. It's either on the right or on the left, depending on what term you're using, but it's clearly not correct. So the hypothetical here is that if you know your left and right, if you have a long-term representation of these things and you just bring it to bear in, uh, in the task, then kids who do better on left-right should also do better in the matching task. That turns out not to be true. This is the matching task accuracy over left and right production accuracy. So what you can see is that the four-year-olds, some of whom are getting 0% uh, percent correct and some of whom are getting 100% correct, are all matching at about 80%. So it doesn't matter whether you have the ability to produce these terms accurately in the post-test. It also doesn't matter if you understand them in the post-task. So again, we've got this no correlation at all between the extent to which you know your lefts and rights and your performance in the matching task. Okay? So that what this means uh, to us is that they don't actually have a long-term representation of these terms that are, they're bringing to bear, but they're able to use it right in the moment when we say to them, the red is to the left of green. They're probably coding it somehow as, so that's, that's the one, the, the, the red is the one that's called left at that moment. But I'll say more about what the format must be. So now, what's the uh, nature of the linguistic representation? It's both syntactic and lexical. And so red is left of green works, but red is touching green does not work. So to explain this difference, I'm going to argue, you need both the syntactic frame, x is left of y, and you need the value, the lexical item, the directional uh, value of left. So let's start with the syntactic frame. This uh, specifies figure ground roles and thereby alters the prominence of the two entities. It tells you which is the figure and which is the reference object. So if I say red is left of green, that means the green is the ground object and X and, and uh, red is the figure in the figure uh, object place. This is, um, is a, actually a widely noted and, um, and, under, and, and fairly well understood phenomenon. Lila Gleitman has done a lot of work. The linguist Len Talmy has done a lot of work. Um, uh, the psychologist Amos Tversky actually used this in some early work on similarity, and Eleanor Roche has, has also had did, done work on this. And here are some examples that we can give. So there's a difference between saying North Korea is similar to China than China is similar to North Korea. One is preferred to the other. One sounds more natural to the other. And that's because North Korea is similar to China sounds more natural because China is the natural, at least at this moment, China is the natural ground or reference object and North Korea is, per, is compared to it in some respects. The example from Len Tell Me is Clark Kent is Superman is better than Superman is Clark Kent. Why? Because Superman is the thing being compared to, and Clark Kent is the, the figure object being compared to uh, Superman. And then finally, the Gleitmans did this great experiment where they gave people nonsense uh, uh, sentences like the Zoom met the Dax. If A meets B, then B meets A as well. But they asked people later to rate the properties of the Zoom and the Dax, nonsense things. And they found out that the Dax was old, evaluated as older, bigger, more famous, and more important. Okay, so. The effects of this syntactic asymmetry, what's in figure and what's in ground, shows up in commonplace usage. And I hope there are fans of Saturday Night Live here, because we'll have a few pieces of data from them. The first example has to do with Alec Baldwin and our president. And so 
as you know, Alec Baldwin has been playing the role of the president on Saturday Night Live, and this gave me the opportunity to do a Google search on Alec Baldwin looks like Donald Trump versus Donald Trump looks like Alec Baldwin, okay? So in principle, if Donald Trump is the comparator that Alec Baldwin is being compared to, you should have a larger number of hits. It's just like the Zoom met the DAX, with the DAX being the, the older and more important. So indeed, there are more instances of Alec Baldwin looks like Do Donald Trump, 780,000, compared to 497 of the other variety. Because this is psychological, the Association for Psychological Science, of course, it's a replication. So it was a replication of an earlier finding. It also showed up in 2016. So I had done a search at the time on Larry David looks like Bernie Sanders. And it turns out the hit is 22 million, whereas Bernie Sanders looks like Larry David is only 5 million. So again, you get this huge asymmetry in the way that the thing is framed. And finally, the original finding is with, of course, <laughs> Tina Fey and Sarah Palin. Tina Fey looks like Sarah Palin, 2 million hits. Sarah Palin looks like Tina Fey, only 288,000. Okay, so it's a big phenomenon. It's also true in addition to the frame that the lexical content matters. So this sets up, using left sets up a very strong non-reversible property. So if X is left of Y, then Y is not left of X. And so, so it's impossible to, if X is left of Y, then Y can't be uh, left of X. It has to be not left of X. So it's highly asymmetrical. So combining the frame idea with the lexical content, we can come to a very counterintuitive prediction, which was actually, it was a great challenge because uh, a linguist in our department suggested that this would be a prediction if we really believed it was frames plus the lexical value of an asymmetric term. If this non-reversibility, the directionality of that item matters, then if we say to the kids, red is prettier than green, that should work too. So we bit the bullet and we did the experiment. In an experiment five, we had three conditions. One was a no-label condition. The second was the directional, the reds on the left, right, top, bottom. And the third was the red is prettier, nicer, lighter than the green, which one is exactly the same as the one you just saw, three different groups of subjects. And here's what happens. No-label is still in the 60s. Directional is again in the around 80. And prettier is right up there with directional left and right. And so this asymmetrical concept, prettier, actually works for four-year-olds to carry over the binding of the color location in this very, very local context. We also did a difference. Everything has been a one-second delay. We did a four-second delay. It turns out that directional terms, the lefts and rights, really have a persisting value, whereas the prettier terms decline a little bit. Um, but I think that's just a detail. I want to say, importantly, there's also a developmental story to this, uh, this line of experiments. We did the work with three-year-olds. They can't take advantage of left or prettier. So we did the no-label condition, the directional condition, and the prettier condition. These are not reliably different from each other. They're a little bit lower than the, uh, the four-year-olds. They're at 50% 55 instead of 60%, but there's no effect of the linguistic context. Six-year-olds need not take advantage of left and prettier actually interferes. So six-year-olds actually are get way up high whether they have a label or not, or, or, or given a directional information. And so we think that what they're doing is basically automatically labeling, not consciously. We're not talking about a conscious process here, but it's an automatic labeling. And adults can't help but take advantage. So we did the obligatory um, um, task, the same task with a secondary shadowing task in which you have to be talking and making verbal decisions along as you're doing the task. It's actually incredibly hard to do this if you're a participant. So we have no shadow condition, and then there are verbal shadow conditions where you have to repeat, uh, you're hearing these terms in your earpiece, and you have to repeat as you hear them left, right, top, bottom, north, east, south, west, and so forth. So you're giving yourself spatial terms. Then we had non-spatial terms, so note, meant, Finish, small, good. You're hearing these in your earbud, and you have to repeat them as you're doing the task. And then a rhythm shadow, where you're just shadowing or tapping the rhythm that you hear. And here's what happens. The no shadow condition is way up at ceiling. Um, that's because I think the adults are just doing it obligatorily and automatically. Rhythm shadow is also way up there, which means that the verbal, it's not a verbal interference, but the verbal shadowing conditions both do interfere with the, um, with the, um, the performance. OK, so what does language do? I'm going to say it's a momentary change. It's right in the context of the experiment, because those kids just don't know their lefts and rights at the end, after the task. 
The linguistic information is syntactic, the frame matters, it's lexical, the term matters, and it's very, very abstract because prettier also works. And how powerful is it? It's very powerful is what I'm going to say, and I'm going to have, um, read a quote from George Miller in 1956 when he was talking about verbal recoding in a different context, in a context that had to do with memory functions and chunking items into units. But he said, if you think of this verbal recoding merely as a mnemonic trick for extending the memory span, you will miss the more important point that's implicit in nearly all such mnemonic devices. The point is, that recoding is an extremely powerful weapon for increasing the amount of information. In this case, I think it's the type of information that we can deal with. In one form or another, we're recoding constantly in our daily behavior. So does language change thought? And if so, how? Well, I said there are two, two views. One's definitely, one's not definitely, uh, definitely not. My view is in the middle. I'm going to say that language can recode. It does very frequently by this powerful formalism. It's not just a single word, it's syntax as well. It be, the effects are momentary. It becomes automatic, uh, more automatic throughout development, and it confers an advantage for cognition more generally. So the point I want to make here is that um, this is sort of following Dehan and Cohn's um, neural recycling hypothesis, which is that you start out with one kind of a visual system, a visual system that actually doesn't care about reflections. So this is the same cup whether it's facing rightwards or leftwards. We don't care about the directional facing for a visual image of an object. But we do have to come to the point where we do care about it when we do, for example, the learning of letters. So we have to be able to distinguish P's from B's from D's. So although the object system isn't prepared to encode these differences among the reflections, once you get language in there, it can mark those representations and distinguish them. However, importantly, this does not change the non-linguistic representation. So I want to remind you that you as adults who have full-fledged language and use it all the time and so forth, when I gave you the search task, you acted like everybody else acts. If it's a single feature, it's a pop-out. If it's a combined feature, it's hard and it takes time. So that's where language comes in and can amplify. I'm going to just note that momentary effects of language are ubiquitous. I'm actually not going to go through these because I think <clears throat> due to time, but there are many, many cases in the field where things that are, that are reported as massive effects of language on thought actually are momentary effects. This goes for the color literature, the space literature, and many others. And I'm going to return to the original hypotheses, version one and two. So the classic Warfian hypothesis, does language reshape non-linguistic thought? My answer is no, it does not. All effects are momentary. It, it confers a huge advantage, but the effects are momentary. The non-linguistic categories are just left intact. This is true for color. It's true for the domain of space. And it's true for a category of uh, linguistic markings called evidentials, the, deg the degree to which you know the source of your information. And I want to just comment, for those of you who are interested in this literature, you should go back and read Kay and Kempton from 1984, because they actually say exactly the same thing, not in these terms, but they do not claim that there are changes in perceptual discrimination. Quite the contrary. They, they show that it's not a change in perceptual discrimination. And I think this has gotten lost in the mix. So version two, radical transformation. Does language radically transform thought? I think in a way, yes. It recodes thought via this formalism that's advantageous to cognition. It allows you to mark things that you wouldn't be able to in your non-linguistic system. Therefore, having a language does radically transform cognition. And the syntactic frame is one of the examples that helps us to change and create new representations. There are many other ways in which syntactic frames have their effect. I'll give you some examples. So in source goal assignment, if something is moving from A to B, it's both true that they moved from A to B. And visually, you're not able to distinguish between what it is that you're focusing on. But language provides you a way of focusing on whether you're focusing on the goal or the source. Learning the meanings of novel verbs. Uh, the difference between Jane blicked the baby, a novel, a novel verb, and Jane blicked. Even toddlers can actually use the syntactic frame to decide whether or not it's a causal event or a non-causal event. Jane doing something to the baby or Jane just doing something on her own. Political persuasion, the way that we frame these things, North Korea is similar to China versus China is similar to North Korea. 
Huge differences in the framing. Now, as Lila Gleitman has pointed out many times, this is not about the, the idea of similarity, which is what Tversky want, uh, thought that it was. It's about the language and the information that is carried by the language frame. These are different ideas. Legal responsibility. The bus collided with, uh, the, bus collided with the bike versus the bus and the bike collided. So if the bus collided with the bike, it's probably going to be the bus's company that pays. But if it's the bus and the bike collided, it's probably going to be no fault. So you're able to derive different kinds of inferences from using these two different frames. And a recent observation from Chestnut and Markman that I think is quite profound, gender biases. So how many times do we say, girls are as good at math as boys? That's putting boys in the reference position and girls in the figure. The girls are being compared to the boys. And that immediately say it sets up an asymmetry. My final word is this. The structural properties of language have been shown to be crucial for the case of the blind child who learns the meanings of look and see. The structural properties of language are also crucial for the case of the sighted child whose rich perceptual systems have surprising limits with respect to products of the mind. And I just gave you the example of the figure ground case, the red and the green case. But there are also some really interesting cases out there in the literature. One is on number from Spipen, Golden Meadow, uh, Carey and Spelke and others that shows that home signers, Nicaraguan home signers who do, do not have, have full-fledged numerical system in their sign system actually perform differently on number number tasks in which they're shown to do more estimation and less precise numerical uh, judgments. And finally, the idea of theory of mind. There's a group, Jill de Villiers and others, that have argued that learning about other people's minds is actually deeply entwined with the way that we express it in language. And especially for those of you who know about language or are, are linguists or psycholinguists in the, in, the, in the audience, it's about the complement structure, that mental verbs take complement structures that specify that you're talking about the contents of mind rather than anything out there. And so the same lesson applies to the blind child and to the sighted child. And I just want to give a nod to the future. These are ongoing studies in my lab. I just said that the structure of the language is crucial for the case of the sighted child, whose rich perceptual systems have surprising limits with respect to products of mind. And the really fascinating set of studies that are now ongoing in the lab have to do with sighted children's understanding about what the verb see means. It's remarkably limited relative to what you think, because all of these children see. However, there are very, very different judgments by young children about whether or not a blind person can see. When do you use the word see? Turns out that blind adults are perfectly happy with using the verb see for their own activities. But children are much narrower in their interpretation. And finally, the syntax plays a huge role. So we're studying when young children understand when people see that something. So the example I'll give you is uh, the dog runs. Uh, there, there, somebody's baking cookies. They go out of the room. A dog comes in and eats up all the cookies. The person comes back in and says, oh my god, you're eating the cookies. And the dog runs away, leaving crumbs on the floor. Two different questions. Did the girl see? the dog eating the cookies? Yes, if she was present. Did the girl see that the dog ate cookies? You can actually infer that. The answer could be yes if you only saw crumbs on the floor. But this is a developmental accomplishment to begin to use see in this much broader sense that has to do with examining um, um, aspects of inference that we use in seeing. And with that, I'll close. I want to give acknowledgments to everybody in my lab. This is not everybody in my lab throughout the years, but many, many people who worked on this problem and many related problems. This is my annual soccer uh, uh, croquet party in the backyard, along with now deceased dogs, two Dalmatians. Um, and, but the, the, the biggest um, uh, acknowledgment I, I want to give is to Lila Gleitman, who I started out with. And I think we share a lot of ideas together. And certainly, the idea of asymmetry is one that she holds very, very dear. And I think she'd be happy that I was talking about this work. Thank you.